Before we get started, if you join us this morning, you should be familiar with these items, but allow me to repeat this for our new joiners. If you experience any issues with your audio or video during the broadcast, please simply try refreshing your browser. You are all watching from the main stage and anytime throughout, you may submit your questions to any of our speakers please type them on the Q&A session of our event platform. Throughout the three days, you will be able to access Expo, which you can find on the event platform's menu bar, where you will find more information and useful resources about our 15 featured listed companies. For today, we have both moderators from Monday Nishin, Max Group. These two companies that join us for our morning session. And joining me today in the afternoon are Century Pacific Food, The Keepers Holdings, and Exelum Resources Corp. By visiting the expo session and clicking on their booths, you will be able to interact with them via chat, schedule a meeting, and access a wealth of resources about their companies. That said, I did like to kickstart this afternoon session with our food and beverage outlook. May I have the slides, please? Thank you very much. I'm Ken Fong and I'm the Equity Research Analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence, covering the ASEAN real estate, consumer products and conglomerates sector. I would like to present to you today our outlook on the Philippines food and beverage sector. First of all, I would like to talk a little bit about Bloomberg Intelligence. Here at Bloomberg Intelligence, we are an independent research provider where there are 400 research professionals covering more than 135 industries and more than 2,000 companies spread across the global market. Today, I'm going to run through about the price performance and valuation of the food and beverage sector. Next, I will move on to talk about the revenue growth drivers, and then I would like to address on how cost inflation might includes packaged food companies in the Philippines, China, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Japan, Singapore, India, Thailand, and Vietnam. And if you look at this index, it was hovering around 175 to 190 points in 2019 before the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, it dropped to a trough of around 157 points in March 2020 before recurring to above pre-COVID levels after that. This is supported by the increase in demand and stocking up of food supplies. After reaching a peak of around 210 points in January 2021, the index gradually declined as consumers reduced stockpiling of food along with the increase in vaccination rates. In third quarter of 2021, the index rebounded to a peak of around 200 points due to the tightening of COVID restrictions before gradually declining again as social distancing measures were gradually eased in the fourth quarter of 2021 and into the first quarter this year. Then, the war in Ukraine, which resulted in raw material cost inflation, impacted the profitability of the food and beverage sector and hence its performance. 
Next, we are going to look at the historical 12-month forward price to earnings multiples for the BI Asia Pacific Package Food Index based on consensus estimates. We see that the index fell to a trough of about 16.8 times 12-month forward PE in March 2020 when the pandemic first hit. Thereafter, we have seen an increase in the valuation along with increase in demand for food supplies due to stocking up as a result of the lockdown. The valuation then gradually declined as consumers reduce how much food they stock up at home and also out of home food consumption were impacted as consumers were spending more time at home. Besides, raw material cost inflation were also starting to impact profitability of the food and beverage industry. The negative impact from this raw material cost inflation became more pronounced this year since the war in Ukraine which resulted in a greater increase in raw material costs. This led the valuation of the BI Asia Pacific Package Food Index to further decline to a low of 15.7 times, which is below the historical average of 20.4 times and the trough of 16.8 times seen in March 2020. Companies are now trying to focus on price hikes and cost control to partly mitigate the negative impact from the raw material cost inflation. Next, we would like to look at how the economic recovery this year could drive revenue growth for the food and beverage industry. Consumers may be more willing to increase their spending as economic conditions in the Philippines recover amid easing of social distancing measures. This could lead to higher consumption of food and beverage products as well as out of home spending as consumers spend more on food products and at restaurants out of home. Consensus forecasts GDP growth of 6.7% this year and 6.2% in 2023. Both are slightly higher than levels seen before the pandemic, as well as above 5.7% seen last year. Next, we would like to look at the food and beverage consumption in the Philippines. Food and, be food and non-alcoholic beverage consumption could grow by 4 to 6% this year and remain the main component of the Philippines household consumption, supporting the F&B sector revenue growth. This could be driven by an economic recovery, leading to an increase in volume and higher prices to partly cushion the raw material cost inflation impact. Food and beverage consumption rose by 5.7, uh, sorry, 5.4% a year over 2009 to 2019, the 10 year period before the pandemic. And it made up around 35% of household consumption. Food and beverage spending increased at a similar rate of around 5% in 2020, but was a higher proportion of household spending at around 38.6% due to pandemic-led restrictions. Growth slowed to around 3.4% in 2021 as consumers reduced how much food they stock up at home due to the gradual easing of COVID restrictions. This year, food and beverage consumption in the Philippines, according to our scenario analysis, we think that it may grow by 4 to 6%, supported by higher demand due to the economic recovery and higher prices to partly offset the raw material cost inflation. 
next, we would like to look at the restaurants and hotels consumption in the Philippines. We think that household consumptions at restaurants and hotels could grow by more than 20% this year based on our scenario analysis. And this is driven by a gradual easing of COVID measures. We think that this supports the revenue of restaurants and food and beverage industry in the Philippines. Spending at restaurants and hotels rose by 7.6% a year during the 10-year historical period pre-pandemic from 2009 to 2019. And this accounted for around 9% of household consumption in the Philippines. Spending at restaurants and hotels was hard hit by the pandemic, which we saw a decline of 43.1% in 2020 before recovering by 5.1% in 2021. This is still roughly 40% below 2019's levels, and it accounts just around 6% of the household consumption in 2021. This year, household consumption at restaurants and hotels could grow by 20% based on our scenario analysis and its proportion of household consumption could grow as well as consumers spend more time at home. Next, I would like to talk a bit about the consumer confidence in the Philippines. Based on our analysis, consumer confidence could improve this year, benefiting the food and beverage industry as consumers show greater willingness to spend more. This assumes an economic recovery supported by a gradual easing of social distancing measures and a reduction in daily COVID cases through 2022. Yet, a turnaround may be slow, impacted by the Omicron variant in early this year, followed by inflationary pressure as firms try to pass on the higher raw material costs and transportation costs to consumers, which we think this situation could gradually ease towards the end of the year. The impact from the Omicron variant is evidenced by a decline in the Philippines Consumer Confidence Index to minus 24 in fourth quarter of 2021 from minus 19.3 in third quarter last year. This was the first drop since a trough of minus 54.5 first seen um, during the beginning of the pandemic in um, 3Q 2020. Next. I would like to talk a bit about the raw material cost inflation and how it affects um, profitability of the sector. Raw material cost inflation remains a main concern for companies within the food and beverage industry. Main raw materials such as wheat, corn, crude palm oil, coffee and sugar were up by between 47 to 93 percent as seen in the chart since the beginning of 2021. Oil price was up even higher at 122% since the beginning of 2021 and this would impact transportation and freight costs. Much of the spike for some of these raw materials such as wheat, corn, crude palm oil and oil happened since the war in Ukraine started earlier this year. Due to the lag impact and running down of raw material inventories, at the food and beverage companies, the negative impact from these high raw material costs may be more pronounced in the second and third quarter this year, impacting the company's gross margins. Next, we would like to look at the how this um, 
raw material cost inflation impacts the gross margin of companies and also what they are doing to mitigate the impact which would result in their operating margin declining at a lower rate. And this analysis is based on the three companies within our coverage, which includes Universal Robina, Nestle Malaysia, and Vina Milk. What we have seen so far this year is that companies have been increasing prices, and this has been happening since the end of last year, to partly offset the negative impact from raw material cost inflation. This year, companies plan to continue to raise prices and focus on cost control, mainly on sales general and admin costs, to help to mitigate the negative impact from higher raw material costs. Yet, based on our scenario analysis for these three companies that we cover, there are gross margins could decline to 29.1% on average in 2022 from 30.7% in 2021. This is mainly due to the higher raw material costs, partly offset by price increases. These companies may continue to focus on cost control, especially on their SG&A, resulting in a lower decline in operating margin to 14.4% on average this year from 14.6% last year. Thank you very much. That wraps up my presentation. And that is the outlook for the Philippines food and beverage industry. For further details, you may contact me at pphone6 at bloomberg.net. You may also refer to BI FMCG Go if you have access to the Bloomberg terminal for more information on the food and beverage industry. It's two o'clock. Thank you. Now, if I may move on to the next agenda for today. For our first listed company this afternoon, I would like to invite Century Pacific Food Inc. Joining us on the stage is Sir Christopher Poe, Executive Chairman of Century Food, Century Pacific Food Inc. Christopher, over to you. Thank you, Ken. Um, so yeah, maybe just a quick uh, uh, introduction about our company. We are a Philippine-based food company. We are a consumer staples company um, listed on the Philippine Stock Exchange. Our main lines of business, uh, we call them the four M's, marine, meat, milk, and emerging. Um, our brands are um, household brands, brands like Century Tuna, Bird Street Milk, 555 Sardines, Argentina uh, Corned Beef, uh, Hunts, uh, uh, Big Beans, uh, and the like. So these are household names and uh, uh, brands that are found in most uh, cupboards uh, and homes in the Philippines. Um, so I, uh, I'd like to say that we are um, a, uh, a growing company in the last three years. In 2020, we grew by uh, almost 20% on the top line and 24% uh, on the bottom line. Last year, 2021, we grew by uh, mid-teens, 13% uh, revenue growth and then 20% um, uh, net income growth. And then so far in, in uh, quarter one, we're growing by about 9%, right? So this is uh, quarter one of 2022. This is on top of uh, the very high base of, uh, of 2021, right? So uh, maybe what we'll do is we'll have uh, Dappy do a short presentation on the company and then Dappy and I will come back and answer any any questions that we have from the audience. If that's okay. Over to you, Daffy. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and for your interest in our company, Century Pacific Food, Inc. So as Chris mentioned earlier, um, we are one of the largest food and beverage companies in the Philippines focused on providing affordable nutrition to our broad consumer base. We are present in the following segments, the four M's, marine, meat, 
um, and milk, and then our emerging businesses such as plant-based, coconut, among others. And as you can see on this slide, we have a multi-brand portfolio across these different segments spanning multiple price tiers from value for money to mass market to affordable premium brands. And some of the household names that you'd find here are Century Tuna and 555, our flagship brands in marine. There's Argentina, our flagship brand in meat, and birch tree in milk. We have end-to-end -end capabilities with a downstream focus, specifically in R&D and manufacturing. We also have a vast distribution um, network, both for domestic and export sales, plus marketing and customer engagement capabilities. Now, here's a quick view of our decades-long history as a company. We started out as a tuna OEM business, catering to export markets in 1978. Early on, the company was able to identify opportunities for branded, packaged food products, specifically for the local market. Thus, Century began to create our own brands, many of which have become market leaders in their specific categories. We've been strategically diversifying and expanding our portfolio since then, both organically and inorganically, we acquired brands such as Birch Tree and Swift to enter new segments. We have also entered the coconut segment with the addition of the coconut OEM exports business to our portfolio. This later on became the springboard for our branded packaged coconut product, Coco Mama. Most recently, we've had organic additions to our portfolio, namely unmeat or foray into plant-based alternatives. Goodest, our entry for pet food, and Choco Hero, a new brand that expands our dairy portfolio into other segments. Now, as you can see on the next slide, five, the branded business takes up the lion's share of our revenues, 78% um, in 2021. This is composed of marine, meat, milk, and other segments. OEM, on the other hand, comprises 22% of our business. Thus, overall, we cater primarily to the domestic market, which contributes to the majority of our sales. Now, diving into specific segments, namely marine and meat, this is what we call our core business. You'll note that in marine, shelf-stable tuna in particular, we are the dominant player in the category with 83% market share. That's approximately six times bigger than the next biggest competitor. And that's because in tuna, we built the Century Tuna brand over the years as a champion for health and wellness. In meat, we own 50% of the category as Argentina has become the go-to brand for consumers who are seeking affordable yet quality meat products. Going to our emerging businesses, specifically milk, CNPF has been gaining ground in the powdered milk segment, becoming a strong number two player in the category. Um, and over the last five years, we've grown our market share by 12 times from 2 to 2 to, to 24 percent. And we've been able to do so through product innovation and competitive pricing. On the next slide, you'll find our robust pipeline of innovations that we've launched for dairy, most of which are for Birch Tree as we continue to expand the range and strengthen the brand's nutritional credentials. We also launched Choco Hero, which is our entry into the Choco Malt space designed to provide energy for kids. This is our most affordable product to date. Thus, we now have a dual brand play to win in the powdered milk category. At the same time, we are continuously investing in long-term growth by diversifying our portfolio beyond the three M's. We engage in organic and inorganic expansion into adjacent categories. For coconut, inspired by how we built Century Tuna, we leveraged our OEM capabilities and brand building know-how to build a branded packaged coconut product for the domestic market. We launched this in 2019 and it has grown exponentially that since then. And this is the Coco Mama brand. In condiments, we acquired the Hunts brand, which is the market leader in beans in our pursuit to add healthier products and protein sources to our portfolio. Another example of a healthier pursuit is our entry into plant-based meat alternatives with the launch of Unmeat. We leveraged our multi-decade expertise in plant-based ingredients to democratize plant-based products, making it more accessible to consumers. Our goal is to make it easy to eat, 
easy on the pocket and of course easily accessible. So overall, it's healthier, it's better for you, and it's better for the planet. Lastly, in 2021, we entered the fast-growing pet food market with a new brand called Godest, this time leveraging our manufacturing capability in Marine. Another key highlight for Century Pacific is the acquisition of Vigo, a legacy brand known for its range of high-quality sardines and other marine products. This is an accretive, bolt-on, and highly synergistic acquisition, and it is much aligned with our mission to provide affordable nutrition to our consumers, giving us more scale in sardines and in turn strengthening our core marine business. We are pleased to share that we now have the rights to Vigo trademarks and expect the deal to close within the first half of the year. Under the deal, Century Pacific is set to purchase 100% of the operational assets and marks of Vigo through an asset purchase agreement. And this is funded internally um, by our generated cash flows. Um, and the marks purchased were acquired for a consideration of less than 5% of our total assets at a discount to our current and forward EBITDA multiples. We look forward to operating the business and are very excited for this opportunity to grow our presence in Marine. So all in all, um, if you take a look at our strategic priorities, this is what they look like. At the base of the pyramid is our core segments, marine and meat, where we have steady growth, healthy cash generation, and market leading positions. Here, we will continue to strengthen um, these segments and deepen the moat by further growing these categories and our brands. With a strong core, we can then pursue growth and diversification through our emerging businesses, such as milk, a category that demonstrates faster growth. We will continue to invest in this business and build scale as challengers and category builders. And lastly, we continue to pursue long-term growth by innovating in new and adjacent categories, such as coconut, refrigerated, plant-based, and pet food, categories of the future will, which will ensure the sustainability of our growth. So in sum, we are what you can call an all-weather and resilience-focused company. Due to the essentials and staples nature of our portfolio, we tend to deliver low double-digit to mid-teens growth during good times. But in challenging times, as Chris mentioned earlier, we tend to outperform. And in the course of our history, our portfolio has proven resilient amidst various macroeconomic situations. And that ends my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. And now I turn you back over to Chris for a Q&A. Someone will be asking the questions. Thank you. Yes. Ken. Hi. Sorry. Yep. Can Can you hear me now? I can. Hi. Hi, Christopher. Hi, Debbie. Thank you very much for the presentation on Century Pacific Food. Now, if I may begin by asking, what is the overall strategy for your firm? Century Pacific Food is well known for being the leader in tuna, but you actually have a diverse portfolio, including market leading meat products, milk, coconut, plant-based, and even pet food. What's the thinking behind this? Can you please elaborate a bit on your strategy? Thank you. Sure, Ken. Um, yeah, so definitely Century is the flagship brand. Um, the uh, main, we're known mostly for Century Tuna, which is uh, the, uh, the brand that uh, leads the marine category with about a, more than 80 to 85% share of the market. But actually, the tuna business, both the branded and the OEM tuna business, accounts for less than 40% of our total business. And you, correct, you correctly pointed out that we have these other divisions. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have four, four main divisions. Marine, which comprises uh, tuna and sardines. We have meat, which is uh, mostly canned meat, so products like corned beef, uh, meatloaf, uh, sausages, etc., hot dogs. Uh, 
Uh, that's the second M. Uh, third is milk, and then the fourth is emerging, which is a combination of different uh, categories and different products uh, that will hopefully become future growth drivers as well as future business pillars for us. And so the strategy here, um, I would say there are two, uh, two words to describe what we're trying to do. Uh, one is growth and the other is diversification. So the move to go outside of, of Tuna really is uh, to pursue growth. Our, our growth ambition is for us to uh, grow 2x of GDP. So if the Philippine economy uh, grows at say between 5 to 7%, we're really looking to grow our company between 10 to 15%, right? And um, in order for us to uh, make this growth realistic, uh, we cannot rely on just one category. And that's why over the last 40 years, we are, we are after all a 40 year old company, um, we started uh, adding different verticals, adding different uh, divisions to our, to our business, starting off as primarily an OEM business as Daphne had described it earlier, and then getting, getting into branded marine, um, allowing us to build our distribution platform in the Philippines. So once we had those platform, uh, so once we had that distribution and sales platform, we started adding verticals. So we added the meat vertical, milk vertical, and now the other uh, innovations and new categories that we're entering. And so that's really all um, in pursuit of growth. And, and again, it's double digit, 10 to 15 percent by the sustainable growth that we're looking at. Uh, the other is diversification. Um, we don't want to rely on just one category. The tuna category. It's still wild caught, after all, which is the main raw material. And um, it, the raw material prices can be quite volatile uh, because um, it's subject to seasonal forces, weather patterns, weather disturbances, supply and demand that's global. So the volatility of tuna prices uh, can be quite high. And that forced us to go out and really try to diversify. Right? So now, as a uh, more diversified business enterprise, we're able to uh, more steadily deliver uh, predictable uh, uh, revenues and profits. Right? So really the strategies behind going outside of the categories, both growth and diversification. Yep. Thanks, Sir Christopher. It's very clear that um, you are going for a diversification and growth strategy. And thanks for sharing the thoughts behind your, your strategy for the firm. Um, next up, if I could ask about the performance of your firm for the past two years, which has been outperforming. Um, can you please tell us what drove this um, outperformance of your company? And how do you expect the company to perform moving forward? Sure. Uh, so yeah, Ken, um, I, as I mentioned earlier in our introduction, uh, we had quite quite a busy quite a busy last uh, two and a half years uh, of the pandemic. We uh, finished the year 2020 with uh, uh, close to 20 percent revenue growth, and our, our bottom line uh, actually uh, grew faster uh, because of uh, scale effects. Uh, and and that's really uh, as you had mentioned in your introduction, Ken because of the pantry loading, because um, our government was also uh, buying a lot of food uh, to try to distribute um, to uh, our citizens during the lockdowns when a lot of people uh, didn't have jobs right, because people were locked, locked out at home. So we're relying, the government was relying on companies like us to continue to supply food. And ours, we are a shelf-stable food company. So, you know, those pictures from more than two years ago where People were stocking up their grocery carts, you know, filling up their uh, their cupboards and refrigerators with food. Um, I guess they were buying um, uh, products like ours uh, in, in 2021. Even with a high base, we had uh, we had delivered uh, high mid-teens growth of 13 percent. Um, so our branded business grew by around nine to 10 percent. But we also have an OEM business uh, where we serve uh, global uh, tuna brands and retailers, uh, as well as coconut brands and retailers. Uh, that, that business grew by about 30% uh, 
right? So, so there's actually a little bit of diversification there as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned, in the first quarter of 2022, we're growing in the, the mid teens for our Philippine business, call it 14%. Um, our OEM business slowed down a little bit, um, so that uh, total total growth of about 10%. Q1, both top and bottom line. Right? So uh, we attribute this really to two things uh, to answer your question. One is um, the essentials nature of our portfolio, and second is the business model. Right? So our products, you know, these are shelf stable, you know, or canned products that one stocks in, in the cupboard. And you know, one of our main lines of business is sardines. It doesn't get more essential or more basic than that. So, so sardines as a category, the penetration levels are 99% and the frequency of purchase is three, four, five times a week. So this is uh, the type of products that we have and during times of stress, whether it's uh, what we saw in the pandemic or, you know, a few days when the, the country shuts down because of high foods or earthquakes, you know, people retreat to our products, right? So that's why we, I, I preambled the, our discussion by calling ourselves a consumer staples for essentials companies. So that's the first one is the essentials nature of our business. Second is the, the business model where, where I've talked about our branded business, which is mostly Philippine based. That's about 75-80% of our total business. And then 20 to 25% is our OEM business, which serves the global market. Right? So in in 2020, during the pandemic, the bulk of our activity was really in the Philippines that drove that drove the 20% growth. In 2021, even with the high base, we still grew uh, our essentials and branded Philippine business by high single digits. But because the world, the rest of the world was already reopening, our OEM business uh, grew by about 30%, and that allowed us to deliver again double-digit growth. Right. So, um, uh, uh, to answer your question, you know, essentials nature of the portfolio. Second is the uh, uh, the business model where we're fairly diversified, both along categories as well as uh, geographic markets. Yep. Thanks. Um, yep. That's very clear on on your diversification strategy that is helping in terms of your growth going forward. Oh, well, I guess the other question was what's the outlook? Um, yes, your future outlook for the firm. Yeah. Well, I mean, for the near term, uh, I think a lot of uh, fast moving consumer goods companies, um, food companies, uh, food and beverage companies, we're all experiencing the same types of pressure, which is uh, cost, right? This cost pressure. Um, as I mentioned in Q1, uh, our Philippine branded business continues to grow um, in, in the vicinity of about 14 or 15 percent. This is after we've already passed on um, close to 5 percent uh, price increases. Um, so uh, the bulk of that growth is still volume driven, right? So in, a, in times of stress, when uh, the average fa family is trying to stress their budgets, I guess our categories would be a category they would drop last because of, you know, we're basic, right? We're essential. We're, we're a protein source. We're, and, and also in your, in your presentation earlier, you were saying that close to 50% of any household's um, purchases is food, right? And we we end up being part of that uh, of that shopping basket, right? And we're the last to be to be dropped, and right? so that's why um, for the balance of the year, uh, you know, there's still a lot of unknowns. There are more price increases to come. Um, so the thing we'll be watching out for is really um, is purchasing power catching up with with um, with uh, price increases that's that's being experienced in the uh, in the market, right? And um, uh, a good indication that there is some relief uh, and then some improvement in purchasing power is the remittances. I think the latest numbers are showing about a 3% increase in remittances in dollar terms, but in peso terms, it's actually because of the peso devaluation that works up to about a 9 to 10% increase in peso terms, right? So hopefully there is some relief, at least for um, for those who rely on inward remittances. So that's what we'll be watching out for. We're still trying to finish the year as a company at a low double digit type of revenue growth, but then a mid, hopefully a mid to high single digit uh, earnings growth. That's what we're going to try to do. Yep, sure. That I would think is more of the, the short term outlook that you are providing. What about in terms of the longer term prospects for the firm? Uh, sure. Um, you know, hopefully the, the you know these inflationary pressures will 
uh, will be uh, shorter term in nature. We know that uh, you know a big part of this recent spike is on energy, which is a result of the Ukraine and Russia situation. Uh, so hopefully in the next 12 to 24 months that uh, inflation would uh, would normalize, uh, and that tends to mean you know we would have increased prices then our costs. Uh, the raw material prices come down and hopefully the margins start to expand again. That's what we would look, look forward to uh, as a company. Um, and uh, just in terms of you know driving our management team, as I mentioned earlier, Ken, um, our, our goal is to grow 2x of GDP. So you know 10 to 15 percent type of growth compounded. This is the if you look at you look at the last five years, we, we compounded our uh, revenue and bottom line by about 14, 15 percent. So we hope to deliver that also um, uh, the next five years, right? So roughly doubling the size of the company. And um, uh, numbers aside, uh, we're also trying to become. We're a food company, so we're trying to become a healthier company, a more sustainable company, and you know, healthier. That means our product portfolio, where uh, the categories we're investing in. Um, where you know we deliver more affordable nutrition uh, to the market, right? So that's uh, that's one. The other one is to do things in a more sustainable way. Right? So uh, we want, we're very conscious of the type of uh, uh, footprint that we as manufacturers have in the environment, uh, and then hopefully you know things that we do aside from uh, bringing affordable products to the market that are the, the economic activity we generate. Also has a positive impact on society, right? So, I guess that's uh, that's how it, how I would characterize what we hope to deliver in the next five years. Yep, sure. And perhaps in the topic of inflation as well, um, you mentioned that you are doing um, price increases to to pass on the higher raw material costs to consumers. Um, perhaps if you can elaborate a bit on that, like. Um, can you pass on those higher costs to consumers? And other than um, price increases, what other measures are you doing to mitigate the raw material cost impact? Are there any um, cost savings initiative that could potentially help to lift your profit? And um, would your second quarter sales still be um, resilient? Yep. Thanks. Sure. So the, the last question, uh, second quarter sales are resilient. Um, so April and May, uh, we're still seeing the same kind of um, demand uh, tailwind, if you will. So we're still growing our our revenues at the healthy double-digit clip. I'm talking about the Philippine business here. So that 14 to 15 percent growth in our branded business for Q1, sl slowing down slightly, but still, call it you know 12, 13 percent growth for for April, and then. Um, we're, we're towards the end of May now, so we're seeing uh, some similar type of uh, trading conditions uh, in May, right? Um, now, on, on the cost side, if we were looking at just our costs, our cost of goods sold, we are um, we are seeing we are seeing a cost increase of between fifteen to twenty percent for our costs, uh, but we're also very careful about just immediately passing all of that to the consumer. So we are doing our price increases in tranches. More, in some cases, more than you know, two steps. We we'll take three or even four steps to get to uh, back to our our normal margins. And right? so that's why earlier when I said for this year, we still hope to grow our top line by double digits, but bottom line, um, our profit margins will, uh, our, our profit growth will lag in the top line because we won't be able to. Uh, we don't want to just shock the market and. And increase and just pass on the price increase as we as the costs come in. We want to give the consumer a bit of breathing space and space out the uh, the uh, the price increases, right? Um, so that's that's been our strategy. Whenever we feel uh, inflationary pressures, we you know don't want to shock the consumer and then you know push them to go to other categories, or other 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 brands. Now, um, how we're managing the cost pressures. Um, so, so one is we already discussed it: price increases where we tranche uh, the, the total price increase, and break them into you know, two, three, or even four steps. Uh, we are very actively trying to hedge uh, our cost exposures because um, raw material prices don't go up in a straight line. There is quite a bit of volatility, 
so we are you know being very active and watching closing those raw material prices closely watching those raw material prices and buying at the right prices to hopefully mitigate right so we did come into the year uh with some protection uh in terms of uh in terms of our cost because we we've, we've been able to hedge or buy forward uh, and we continue to do that uh, uh, as we as we uh, uh, go into the next half of the of the year and then looking forward into 2023 so one is you know very active uh, hedging and buying uh, in order to mitigate the costs um, and then something you already mentioned earlier ken is cost reduction right so uh, one is um, the last two years we've been very very uh, we've been we've over i would say over invested in in uh, health and safety of our employees you know vaccines uh, PPE all those social distancing measures that we needed to do in our factories uh, in our offices so some of that goes away right so that's hopefully you know will will soften a little bit of the blow of, of higher costs uh, we're also in the last uh, 18 months we launched a number of innovations uh, in the market right we will continue to support those but we're also slowing down the rate of investment in newer innovations. So we, we're, we're um, going to be launching less innovations this year, just because there's so many factors happening uh, in the market and you know, we want thing for things to stabilize. And there's also a benefit that we don't have to you know, front load the investment of those costs that will hit our p &L, right? So, so those cost reduction measures, uh, belt tightening measure, measures are in place. And then finally, we're just going to try and manage our sales mix so that hopefully we're, we're working with our sales and marketing teams to try and sell more of the high margin products in order to sort of uh, uh, protect the bottom line a little bit, right? So all in all, putting those uh, those three or four things together, price increases, cost reduction, uh, active hedging, and, and then uh, sales mix management. Um, that's what we try to deliver by the end of the year is uh, you know, still double digit revenue growth, but then our, our profit growth will be lagging by you know, a few hundred basis points. Yep, sure. That's very clear on your strategy to tackle this um, rising raw material cost environment as in a lot of investors um, concern currently. And perhaps if we can move a bit to um, your emerging businesses, can you please share a bit on how the milk business is performing and what is your outlook for the milk business? And also perhaps if you can touch a bit on the new categories that you have entered recently, such as, as um, unmeat and the new pet food business, what opportunities are you seeing in these spaces? And how have these um, innovations been performing and where do you see them going forward? Sure. So the, you know, prior to the pandemic, the, meat, the, the dairy business or the, the third M, the milk business, was, uh, was growing quite, uh, quite quickly. It was growing uh, north of 30% compounded uh, over a three or four year period. Um, and from a small part of the portfolio, less than 10%, it, um, you know, it's now approaching 25% of our overall business. So it's really a category that, uh, that, excites, uh, that excites us at Century because um, our economy is getting to that point where uh, the GDP per capita uh, and that GDP per capita is increasing such that consumer behavior starts to change from just you know, basic subsistence uh, type of consuming, they, the, the consumer, it, the average consumer then tries to buy uh, better products, um, healthier products. So there's really a, a, a change in behavior and that's what we were looking forward to. Um, our, um, as a country, our, G, our milk consumption per capita is around 20 uh, kilos per capita. Whereas uh, uh, wealthier, our wealthier ASEAN neighbors like uh, like uh, Thailand, uh, their consumption per capita is about thirty, and then um, Malaysia is at fifty. Right, so so it's it's very clear that very high correlation as the economy um, gets wealthier, milk consumption increases. Right, so that's what we were looking forward to, and that's why we invested in this category um, in the pandemic. Uh, the two years of the pandemic um, uh, growth sort of plateaued it went to it went to you know flat to low very low single digit growth 
because uh, the average family was prioritizing other things. They were prioritizing the protein requirement or the rice requirement. So unfortunately, milk, um, uh, the milk category uh, uh, plateaued during that time. But the good news is in the first quarter, even the first uh, two months of the second quarter, the uh, our milk business is, is growing double digits again, the mid, mid to high teens again. And so uh, I guess a word that, that I'd like to maybe put in is we did gain some market share even while the category was flat or even slightly down uh, during the pandemic years of 2021. Our, our milk business, uh, uh, we did gain uh, one or two market share points. And so showing that the brands uh, were relevant and the value for money proposition uh, really resonated. So, so we're very excited about uh, our dairy business and we see that as a business that will continue to drive future growth. Now on our uh, other other recent innovations and, and market launches, um, the you mentioned the plant-based uh, entry. Yep. So th on, on. that is, um, you know, we are after all a protein company. If you add our our uh, marine business, which is about forty percent, our you know, meat business, which is another about a 15 20 percent 60 70 percent 80 percent of our business is actually protein and we think the future of protein uh, is going plant-based right so our product is we use our own uh, intellectual properties our, our own formulations and we are able to go out and compete in the global market for plant-based meat products um, at a very competitive price and so the market leaders out there um, that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ were able to come in and offer the same product but at a 30, 40, 50 percent price advantage, right? Because we use our own uh, intellectual property. It's, you know, uh, technology that we've developed over the last two, two decades. Um, and then a lot of the materials that go into, into these products we already use for other food, food items. So the scale is immediately there, allowing us to compete um, uh, uh, allowing us to be very competitive uh, on price and um, the the animal meat market globally grows at the rate of you know, zero to two or three percent at most but the plant-based meat market is growing at the teens level right so over time you know this is really something that uh, we want to grow into it's still a very small business for us but uh, it's important for us to be in this category because we are after all a protein company uh, in the next three years, um, that business will be mostly outside of the Philippines because um, that's still a niche category in the Philippines as part of our sort of economic development journey. I think there's a lot of our countrymen here in the Philippines still want you know real meat and you know plant-based and you know planet and climate con concerns are maybe secondary. They still want to eat better and they want the real thing. So for the Philippines, it'll still be animal-based protein. Uh, so the most part of that business, at least in the next two three years, will be coming from the global markets. And we are rolling out on meat uh, in markets like the UAE, the US, Singapore, uh, China. So we've actually identified five markets. Uh, you mentioned the pet food business, where uh, I'm personally very excited about that. Uh, there are a lot of uh, um, demographic tailwinds uh, when it comes to that uh, category. Of, you know, these young folks are forming families later in life, right? Uh, I mean, the average age of people getting married uh, is getting higher and higher. And when they do get married, they're delaying uh, having kids, and this is kind of a substitute. And that's why, you know, putting all of that together, um, the category for pet food in the Philippines, while you know not yet not yet huge, uh, has been growing 25% a year, 25 north of 25% a year compounding at that rate for over the last five years uh, or more. And we see that uh, continue to grow in the future. The penetration of uh, packaged um, pet food in the Philippines is about 5%, right? That means most of our pets here in the Philippines are eating from the table or table scraps, uh, whereas uh, packaged pet food penetration in other ASEAN markets are as high as 20, 40, 50, percent uh, in, in the case of uh, Singapore it's about 60 to 80 percent right? so um, there's going I'm, I'm very excited about this category and it's it's something that hopefully will become an important growth pillar or important business pillar for Central Pacific into the future 
Yep, yep, sure. I guess there's a lot of exciting growth opportunities there within the company. And if I may just add, our US analysts actually expect the Asia Pacific plant based market to grow at a KGAR of 17% up to 2030. So, certainly very exciting opportunities for the firm and, and also in the respective um, markets that you are in. Next, if I may touch upon your recent acquisition of Digo, perhaps if you can give a bit more details about this acquisition and what is the rationale behind it and how does it contribute to the overall picture of your company? Sure, sure. Um, no, it's uh, Digo is a, a 60 year old brand, um, very, I call it a heritage or legacy brand in the Philippines, very loyal following. Um, it's, uh, um, it's it's an acquisition where it, I would call it a consolidation um, strategy from our part, where we're acquiring uh, a competitive company and bringing them into the fold. Um, Strategy-wise, or at least the way we think about acquisitions, uh, we look for at least three things, right? One is, does it align with our overall strategy and mission? Uh, number two, um, is it available at a reasonable price or valuation? And third, do we have the right to win? Right? So on the first one, uh, does it align with our strategy and, and mission? Uh, the answer is a resounding yes. It, our mission is affordable nutrition, right? And sardines, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, uh, it's really a base of the pyramid product. And um, uh, it excites us that we're able to you know bring affordable products to the market and have an impact on the overall nutrition of, uh, of the general market, right? So, um, uh, so that's checked for the first requirement. The second requirement, is it uh, available at a reasonable valuation? Um, we, we have a lot of synergies with this, uh, with this business. I mean, we've been in the sardine business for 35 years, so it can integrate very easily. Uh, we have uh, revenue synergies where if you, we map where they're available and where we have uh, our distribution capabilities, we'll be able to expand the reach of Digo on the revenue side. And then on the cost side, a lot of things we buy are similar, right? So we manufacture our own cans. So we can take that volume requirement of, of Digo and you know uh, 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 channel that volume to our, our, our can making capability. So we take that immediately take that margin that otherwise would have gone to a third party and you know make that part of our PL. If you put this all together, the post synergy evaluation uh, on a enterprise value to EBITDA is uh, is uh, a mid sing, mid you know it's a single digit uh, number, right? Which which is lower than our enterprise EV to EBITDA. So that means that you know it's an accurate acquisition. Um, there are some challenges right now on supply chain. So I would say it will take us about 12 months to start um, realizing those synergies, but it is an accurate acquisition. So we're excited about that. And the third is, do we have the right to win? Right? Um, I mentioned this is a business where uh, that we've op operated you know, for 35 years. Um, uh, the, the synergies are there. And, and yes, we think, you know, we, in this category, combining our current starting business and the legal business would be a strong number two uh, player. And as the, as the industry consolidates, we, you know, we hope to uh, make this an even more attractive uh, category. So, so, you know, it checks all the boxes, Ken, and that's why we went ahead and we're quite pleased with the, the legal acquisition. Sure, thank you very much, Sir Christopher. I guess that comes to the end of our Q&A session. Um, any final remarks from you? Uh, sure, no, well, thank you. Thank you, Ken, and, and for all of those uh, listening in the audience, you know, we're, um, thank you for your interest. Um, we mentioned earlier that we are uh, a consumer goods company. Uh, during times of, during regular regular times, we try to deliver uh, 10 to 15 percent type of growth via our established growth engines as well as our innovation, our investments in innovation. But during times of stress, like what we saw in 2020 and 2021, we're able to outperform uh, because our our consumers and because of the essential nature of our of our of our products, our consumers retreat to us and then you know we tend to outperform in those times and. Now we're experiencing a different kind of stress uh, so far in Q1 and even more than halfway into Q2, we are still 
able to you know deliver decent business results and you know hopefully that uh, that uh, we're able to uh, deliver on that ambition of ours to grow 10 to 15 percent over the next five years double the business you know in the next uh, five to seven years right so uh, thank you for your interest and uh, happy to answer any future questions please come on to our website uh, and, uh, and send us a message thank you very much sir christopher and debbie for your time um, now if we can move on to our next section